Hello, hello, hello guys and welcome back to Joe's Ventures and today we're doing part 121 of our Planet Zoo Mod Spotlights where we take a look at some of the wonderful mods people have been making and talk about some of the wonderful biodiversity that we share our world with. So today we've got a couple very interesting animals, got mostly extinct animals today which is not very often but we do have one animal that could be very close to extinction which is a very sad thing as you've seen on the thumbnail i put on the thumbnail because i want to talk about it but yeah really excited to get stuck into this one so we're going to be starting off with the goldie's uh marmoset or goldie's monkey by uh leaf and jen so cute little animal here so the goldie's monkey or goldie's marmoset you can see they're quite a small south american marmoset or like new new world monkey from uh, the new world so they come from the upper amazon basin and found in like peru brazil bolivia and colombia and the only species in their genus of camico and it sometimes leads these uh, monkeys to be referred to as camilos and take their name after their discoverer the swiss brazilian naturalist uh, emil august goldie so you can see they're quite a dark color they're like a black black to blackish brown in color and have the hair on their head and tail can sometimes be red white or silvery brown and you can see they've got quite long bodies uh they have uh about eight to nine inches or 20 to 23 centimeters uh and their tails can get 10 to 12 inches or about 30 25 to 30 centimeters and they weigh about 0 0.48 kilograms in the captivity and about uh, 0 0.5 kilograms or about 500 grams in the wild so they get a little bit bigger in the wild and their digits all have claws except for the hylax which is very interesting as they use it for climbing uh, walking around and extracting uh, food from trees so as i mentioned these guys uh come from the colombian amazon and the rio cotera in the peruvian rainforest and down to the western brazil things like that in sightings have been seen around the base of the andes and things like that also in peru they can be found in the north of the country there's reserves where you can find them and some of these records have been uh, caught from the 70s by trapping and early 2010s trying to see them and trying to see breeding and things like that and providing these stations mimic their calls they can actually attract uh, some of these marmosets to the areas that they live which is really really interesting well, not where they live but where they um uh trying to survey from and um golden marmosets uh, goldie's marmosets are actually preferred to forage deep underbrush and because of this, that actually can make them a little bit rarer. They like to live in separate patches of habitat. And sometimes these may be like separated by uh, unsuitable flora by, for miles. So that leads to groups being pretty isolated. Uh, but in the wet season, they'll come out and like uh, feed on fruits, insects, uh, spiders, frogs, lizards, and snakes. So pretty generous diet. But in the dry season, they'll also feed on fungi, and they're actually the only tropical primate known to like rely on fungi quite a bit, which is quite interesting. And they live in small groups, typically of up to six individuals, and they stay within a few feet of each other at most times, staying in contact with really high-pitched calls. And they're also known to form quite polyspecific groups, so that means they'll form groups with multiple species of tamarins that include the white-lipped tamarin and the brown uh Ma uh, mantle tamarind which is things and it's perhaps uh, because the goldies marmosets are not known to have the x-line polymorphism that has the uh that some individuals of the new world monkeys have so they can't see all the colors and they uh, see and full trichromatic vision so they can't see all the colors so they kind of use these other ones around to help better see food and things like that which is quite interesting but what's really interesting about these guys is their kind of reproduction so um, there's a lot of research into that. So females will typically reach sexual maturity about eight and a half months and males at about 16 and a half months. And they have a gestation period of between 144 to 159 days. And studied, they've been studied in captivity in North America and Europe for nearly 40 years. That's why we know so much about them. And they've shown to produce on average about three and a half offspring during their lifetime. Though 30% of females and 45% of males observed have failed to reproduce. And unlike other New World monkeys, they actually can give birth twice a year. So biannual births occur more regular in captivity, but they're obviously less consistent in the wild because there's a less amount of resources allocated to these guys. And, um, and attributed to postpartum estrus, they allow the female to reproduce kind of as soon as she's given birth. Uh, the availability of fungi also as well is quite important for the birth rates of the Goldies uh, marmosets. 
And the mother will typically carry a single baby monkey during her pregnancy, but as most species can carry uh, up to twins. Love look at the cute little babies while we talk about that. They can carry up to twins. The singleton babies of offspring provide, uh, provide the offspring longer maternal care and weaning delay, and they rely on their faster growth rates, and they reach sexual maturity earlier than a lot of other marmosets. So they have one baby and get it just ready to go, ready to breed as fast as possible, rather than have, potentially having twins. So um, that's pretty interesting. So for the first two to three weeks, the mother will act as the primary caregiver, and the fathers and the helpers share some other responsibilities. However, mothers in the wild have been observed giving their babies to other members of the troop as early as 10 days after patrician, so they will give their babies to other marmosets for babysitting pretty quickly, uh, which is late uh, for other marmosets, which is quite interesting. So these are guys are pretty attentive mothers as well but they will as early as 10 days so others will be more ready these guys are a little bit more it's in it but 10 days is still quite early uh, at birth these guys are about 10 percent the weight of their mother with a 20 uh 20 mama sets away double that amount and which explains the delay in allocare care in this species which is not a crucial for the counterparts cooperative care in these guys also helps the mother recover from gestation and lactation to care of the baby and recover from all that energy also, caregivers may actually provide food for the infants when they turn about four weeks of age. This is includes, uh, this task of food provisioning increases tolerances of food robbing and infants are kind of learning how to forage. And then also, mothers will start will stop nursing at week four. And is also believed by influence of the presence of observers as well. And it's expected that new, uh, nursing resumes when humans are not present, which is also quite interesting. Whether in, in captivity, nursing will actually be extended quite a bit to about eight to 15 uh, weeks old. Thus, the offspring will be weaned when it becomes about 63 days old. And there's no difference between male and female uh, helpers in the about involvement. And even juveniles uh, will be active caregivers of younger babies. So that's quite interesting. Uh, infants are actually carried entirely during the first month and 63% of their time in the next month of their life. They do not leave their guardian side until they're about two and a half months old and about three months of age. They are really carried. But locomotive independence comes more forcefully than voluntarily so they don't really want to climb around and females will outnumber males by two to one and they have an expected life capacity um life expectancy captivity about 10 years so quite long lived uh from birth to about 18 months they'll actually grow faster as well than other marmosets uh but in part the energy would be used in thermal regulation and activity because it's not carried out by the mother and it's directed into growth and likewise they have a longer lactation so they're a little bit different than a lot of other marmosets in terms of reproduction and stuff which is very very interesting it's really really cool that we have these guys really like to see these little marmosets so these guys again were done by leaf and jen did a really wonderful job with that so pretty much all from now on these kind of five mods all around here are all done by Norwala. So there's one returning one and four new uh, animals, and they're all extinct animals. So I know you guys will be very happy with that. So we're going to be starting off next. Uh, this is kind of a remake. We have got a Aptornis or the elephant bird. So really, really awesome animal here. So these guys are an extinct genus of elephant bird that are only found in Madagascar. And there's two species. Uh, uh, Hildebrandi and A. Maximus, and there's actually potentially, or oh, most likely, is the largest bird to have ever lived. Uh, and is closely related to the Kiwi of New Zealand, even though they live in Madagascar, we get into that. And we're extinct about a thousand or so uh, CE, uh, probably as a result of human activity. So the taxonomy has been a little bit all over the place. There's been as many as like uh, 10 species described often. But now, most recent stuff considers only two species, which is A. Hildebrandi and A. Maximus. Um, most of these guys um, kind of are, are considered within those two species, and there was a Varombe Titan described in 2018, but these are now thought to just be larger females of uh, a Hildebrandi, I think. So they're supposed to be pretty large females. So they're pretty indistinguishable, and they're just large females. And you can see they've been described as many as. Uh, let me count. One, two, three. 12. So there's been many as 12 species described, but now it's kind of considered just two. There's A. Maximus and A. Hildebrandi. So these guys are ratites, so they're related to animals such as ostriches, rays, emus, kiwis, and uh, cassowaries. And they are a ratite, ratite, so they cannot fly. And they have a breastbone with no keel. And they're also related to tinamous as well, which can fly. And because uh, Madagascar and Africa were separated before the ratite lineage arose, 
some people think that uh, the ancestors of kiwis and elephant birds kind of lived in Gondwana and then spread apart with uh, the ancestors of kiwis uh, managing to live in New Zealand and fly to New Zealand. And we do have a kiwi with wings, actually. That's really interesting, a little protoapteryx, which uh, can fly or potentially could fly. Um, and then you have the ancestors of the elephant birds that are related to them probably about 26 million years ago during the Oligocene, split off. Kiwis went kiwis and the ancestors of the elephant birds went to Madagascar and became elephant birds, which is really interesting. And because we know that through DNA, DNA sequencing, which is really interesting, and they're believed to have diverged over 50 million years ago in that regard, though potentially a little bit earlier, which is quite interesting. Uh, the species of Aepjornis is among the largest birds, so they've been known to get about 235 kilograms or 520 pounds for the species uh, A. hildebrandi, and the larger one A. maximus is between 275 and, un and a ton, so it's between 610 to 2,220 pounds, so a ton, which would make the largest or one of the largest birds to ever live. And they also weren't the tallest though, they would have reached about 3 meters of height, which is a little bit shorter than the uh, giant mowers, but definitely much heavier, because giant mowers only got to like 250 kilograms at the biggest, or even 270 maybe. But um, A. Maximus is the biggest one, so uh, the head bore a kind of a conical beak, that you can see quite conical, like a cone. And um, it was proportionally larger in A. Hildebrandi than Maximus, though they both had quite small heads for their body size. So Hildebrandi was a little bit smaller, but with a bigger head. But um, uh, the Maximus was bigger with uh, like a smaller head, and obviously that's kind of the easiest way to tell them apart. Uh, the pelvis bones as well are heavy fused to each other as well, and they have quite robust limbs and forelimb, uh, not forelimbs, uh, quite robust uh, legs as you can see to carry all that body weight it's a really big robust animal the females and stuff are quite big and the females of a maximus are suggested to be uh larger than the males as observed in most ratites so like kiwis and stuff the females are bigger than males and that's why the rombe titan was considered just a very large female um a maximus because their dna was pretty much indistinguishable and that kind of makes sense if it's a large female in terms of ecology, we do have endocasts of both species, and that suggests that they have reduced optic lobes, so they probably didn't have quite good sight. So potentially, like kiwis, they may have had a nocturnal lifestyle. Uh, it's kind of possible, or they could have just been used to uh, really dim forests and things like that. It's not really a hard and fast rule, it just means they have bad eyesight. They may be nocturnal, may have just been used to living in dim forests, or may have just relied on other senses. That's something as well that they could be used. You also have A. Maximus, also has uh, a relatively large olfactory bulbs compared to H. Hildebrandi. It suggests that the former occupied forest habitat where a sense of smell was more important, as I mentioned. And they also suggested to have gone through uh, growth spurts instead of periodic growth, uh, periodic growth instead of just growing continuously. And a 2022 isotope study suggests that individuals of uh, Aeoptornis hildebrandi uh, from central Madagascar were mixed feeders and had a large grazing component to diet, quite similar to rayas in that regard, which is really interesting. And uh, while A. maximus is the one here, is more adapted to being a browser. And isotopes as well show that the population of A. hildebrandi uh, our northern Madagascar were actually more browsers than mixed feeders. That shows even within a species, in different areas, they will be feeding on different things. So it's, um, I think that's quite interesting to show that. Just because it's shown that one area they're eating all the same uh, different things doesn't mean they're going to be eating the same in their entire range. So A. maximus seems to be much more of a browser, uh, and A. Childer brandy, depending on the areas, could be mixed grazer to browser, which is quite interesting. And it probably depends on habitat as well, because some areas of Madagascar are quite a bit more open than some others. There's some areas with open uh, areas, and then some with forests, because Madagascar is a pretty huge place. It's bigger than New Zealand, which is and all sorts of different habitats within that. And um, we also have an embryonic skeleton of um, Abitornis as well, and an intact ed, which is a great way to talk about the little babies here. And um, it was about 80 to 90% of the way through its incubation. And the skeleton sh uh, shows that even in early ontogenetic stage, the skeleton was actually quite robust and much more comparable to hatchling uh, ostriches or rays. And the eggs of Aeoptornis are the largest of any known abniote or animals that lay eggs. And they have a volume of about 5.6 to 13 liters and can be range in length for about 26 to 40 centimeters. Uh, or about 10 to 16 inches and about 90 to 25 centimeters wide or 7.5 to 9.8 inches which is 160 times greater than that of a chicken egg 
And the large height of this egg uh, would have mean that these guys would have had a lot of calcium stored in their bones to lay these eggs. And um, this would be stored as medullary bone in the femurs of the mothers. And there has been remnants of this tissue described in uh, Abtornis, which is quite interesting. And this is one of the variants, new variants that Nawala has come up with, with the colors. There's also a Zoo Tycoon variant, I should mention, that has the Zoo Tycoon 2 colors. But um, it's quite rare, it's the albino one, and I didn't want to go looking for it. But this is a new variant that he's added, so really, really cool. So let's talk about its extinction. So it's widely believed that Aeoptornis went extinct, or the elephant bird went extinct because of human uh, activities. And most certainly arrival of humans in Madagascar. So they were initially widespread, so they lived all through Madagascar with different species. Uh, obviously you mentioned living in different areas, but they were quite widespread around the place. And one theory states the people that really came to uh, Madagascar, they just hunted all the elephant birds with the Blitzkrieg hypothesis and just drove them all to extinction. And there's indeed evidence they have been killed. And but however, their eggs have been the most vulnerable part of their life, and there have been eggshells found in human fires. So that suggests that they may have just been poaching on the eggs. And they're a very slow breeding animal, so eating the eggs, which means uh, and they only lay probably one or two eggs a time, that means they could very easily hurt the population because they're island species of course and that means they could basically dwindle down the population as they can't replace each other the replacement rate goes down which is a big thing the exact timeline though they went extinct is not certain as there's some believe they may have been uh like the persisted in series stories of these birds and stuff have been preserved in folk memories and there's a radiocarbon dated elephant bird from about 1880s to 70 with a side of bush ring so about uh a little over 2,000 years ago, and it's thought that A. Maximus may be the legendary extinct animal called the from Tupara, which means marsh bird in Malagasy. But out of the many years of failing DNA attempts, DNA has been extracted from uh, eggs as well, so that's really, really cool. Another thing that may have impacted their populations as well is that they had uh, secondary diseases due to hyper diseases from human commercial species. So with the or people arriving on Madagascar, they would have bought chickens and guinea fowl, which have actually um, may have lived with elephant birds and may have spread diseases to them and made their population decline. So that's really, really interesting as well. And they've been found in some fossil sites as well. So we know that they were there and along with elephant birds. So that's another really interesting way they could have gone extinct. But all, really it could have been all of these factors combined together to really hurt the populations. But yeah, really, really cool. Love the new colors and the new updates to the elephant bird. Really, really looks awesome. Nawal has done a wonderful job. So yeah, that's our updated elephant bird. Next up, we've got a new animal from Nawala again. So I'm going to say Nawala's name a lot this episode because he's made a lot today. So we've got another returning animal from Zoo Tycoon. We have got the bush antlered deer or um, Encladoceros. A really, really cool animal. So this is uh, Ecladoceros, which means well-branched deer in Greek, or, or their more common name just the bush antlered deer. They're an extinct genus of deer that has been discovered through Europe into Middle East and Central Asia, and the name was given by uh, Hugh Falconer in 1868. So these guys were a very large deer. They got about 2.5 meters or 8 feet uh, two inches in uh, body length and stand about 1.8 meters or five foot nine at the shoulder only making it slightly smaller than a modern moose so yeah very very big uh, and you can see what really gives them their name is that really really impressive set of antlers they've got going on so uh they have a, and they spin uh split into 12 tines or per peduncle as you can see really splits off and goes ooh, doo, 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 like that and they can get up to 1.7 or five feet six inches wide so really really wide uh, antlers there really really interesting and the most distinctive feature as i mentioned is that comb like antlers especially in some species uh, the species that is here is e dinocaris which is from uh, the early pleistocene of italy but there's about six species described and they may be different things uh, but people haven't really looked at them but it may just be a couple species but these guys are the um kind of species depicted here and um, they're actually thought to uh, be the first ge deer genus with these highly evolved antlers, which is really interesting. And um, even though their cranial and def uh, dental morphology actually is pretty primitive, so it's more similar to like the Rusa uh, or the uh, Samba deer, I believe. It's Samba. Yep. So in morphology, they're kind of most similar to the Samba deer, so they most likely had a similar-ish ecology in that regard. So they were first found, the first uh, find was obviously of the type species, uh, Dinocaris, uh, Dinocaris, I believe you say that, it was found in 1841 
by Florentine naturalist Filipino Nestle. And the earliest species was described from the early Pleistocene of China. And then they kind of went from the early Pleistocene of Europe and China and lived around there. And there's been lots of different forms described. About 12 poorly degrime species are reported. And that continues to be dwindled down. But the most well-known species, as I mentioned here, is uh, Dinotromus. Uh, Dinocarus, I believe you say that. Or Dinocarus, or by, which is the type species. Uh, this is, comes from Italy and the early Pleistocene, so uh, early-ish animal. But yeah, really, really cool. Uh, returning from Zoo Tycoon, and I definitely love the how the antlers have been reconstructed. So awesome that we can have a look at the female and the little babies as well. Look at the cute little baby. So it reminds me a lot. It's like a little mix. It's got a little bit of red deer, a little bit of rusa, a sandbar deer in it. But yeah, really, really cool. I love the colors. Definitely has come out nicely. And you can see that wonderful male there. You can just sit and look at him forever. This. I'm sure a lot of hunters would love to have that as a trophy. It's definitely a very interesting set of antlers. Really, really do love it. So yeah, awesome. Very, very awesome. So next up, we've got another Norwala one. So we're going to be moving from Italy. We're going to be going to uh, Sardinia. So we've got a really, really cool underrated extinct animal going on here. So this is the Sardinian giant otter. So these guys, uh, the scientific name is Megalohydrus. Barcelona, if you say that, and we don't know their exact relationships within the, uh, the populations or within the taxonomy of otters, but it's most likely suspected that these guys, due to obviously morphology, things like that, they would have been an AI sonnet or Lucini branch, they would have been related to like um, the European otter, Lutra Lutra, or the clawless otters, somewhere in there, there has been some suggested that it's actually more related to like clawless otters. But more recently, it's kind of suggested these guys would have been related to the Lutrobrants, so related to Eurasian otters, which is quite interesting. And the species is only known from one specimen, so little can be really said about its distribution, but they've been found in the uh, islands east coast of Sardinia. And the animal is believed to be quite a strong swimmer and inhabitant of the island, so it seems safe to assume it would have lived across the island, though, of Sardinia, and perhaps in some offshore islands. And because of a strong adaptation, we really don't see it anywhere else. It might have been well adapted to these coastal areas. So it's very interesting why it didn't do too well, but very interesting. Uh, in terms of its morphology, so these guys would have been really, really big animals in life. They're bigger than the largest, uh, they're much longer and bigger than the otters of today, like the giant otters. So purely on the basis of its molar, it's been suggested it may have been 17 kilograms. But once you put in the skeleton, rest of the skeleton into account, it actually gets really, really big. So... It is far larger than the giant otter, and which is at about 28 kilograms. These guys got to as heavy as a grey wolf, which would mean it would be the largest animal of Sardinia at the time. So these guys would have been around then. And they have so many strong adaptations for swimming, so probably much better swimmer than most other otters. So they have a highly flattened tail, as you're going to see here, almost like a really long beaver's tail. So that's dorsal ventrally flattened, is the term. And it seems to have claws adapted for catching bottom-dwelling fish and crustaceans. And some quite extreme adaptations as well, including its extreme size. And actually would have actually shared the island with two other species of other Sardinian endemic otters. So that shows they would have been eating a uh, lot of different things in different niche, niche partitioning. So one species was Salalutra, um, Sardalutra and Sunlea, which was a small marine otter kind of well adapted for hunting fast fish. The other one, Ajoluta majori, which are hunted crustaceans. So these guys would have been kind of the big one on the block, kind of hunting larger animals and feeding on larger crustaceans or things like that. So you can see there's lots of niche partitioning going within the otters living on Sardinia at the time. And um, it's not surprising that this niche partitioning would took place. And there's also this place Sardinia would have, during the Pleistocene, so these guys are from the Pleistocene, so during the Ice Age, would have had quite a lot of uh, endemic species as it was separated obviously by the Mediterranean. So there has animals like the dwarf deer or Pegamegaloceros cansi, pygmy mammoths like Mammothus uh, laramidii, wild dogs that are quite small like Cynotherium, and an endemic pika or Polagus sandus which, all are, uh, which actually survived into historic times which is really interesting and we don't know what really caused the extinction of the otter but because there's only one specimen known but it's likely an extinction kind of went away, uh, along with uh, the extinction of these guys during the Holocene boundary so people would have come on the island and killed a lot of them and because they're all island slow breeding animals that would have really uh, affected their extinction and 
There's evidence that these might, guys may have cooked her, and maybe the chief causes really don't know exactly. It may have been agriculture just getting rid of a lot of the habitat for these guys, whether it was direct hunting, but it's very likely human related. But yeah, really, really cool. Uh, size estimates are about two to th uh, three meters long, about two and a half to three meters. The average in the game puts it at about two and a half meters, but three meters is obviously reasonable. And the size of a gray wolf. So it's a gray wolf sized uh, otter. And to put that in perspective, the 17 or 28 kilo giant otter today can prey on jaguars and caiman as they hunt in packs. So imagine a pack of these hunting things. They could potentially take down like cows, potentially those pygmy mammoths that are like the size of probably half a ton to a ton, the size of a cow. Uh, so they would have been very, very dangerous. But as you can see uh, here, a great example of that tail. You can see that it's also eventually a uh, flattened tail. It's almost like a long beaver tail and those large claws. Really, really nice reconstruction. Definitely a big fan. And I want to have a look at the little babies because they're so cute. Look at the little baby. Look at the little baby. How cute is he? Let's put you on land so we can get a good look at you. So tell me, how cute is this little guy? See, a really, really awesome reconstruction. Definitely a big fan of how this guy's come out. How cute. Really, really awesome otter. Nawala did a wonderful job. So, next up, we got another island animal. So, we're moving on from Sardinia to another little chain of islands. The uh, Balarctic Islands, if you say that. Uh, we've got Myotragus, also known as the Balarctic uh, Cave Deer. But these are not, are not cave deer. Cave goats, but they're not technically goats. Uh, really, really interesting animal. So... Their name means mouse goat in Latin, and their extinct genus of goat ap antelope in the type uh, uh, tribe uh, Caprini that lived on the Balearic Islands of Malona and Miklona, do you say that? In the Western Met uh, Mediterranean, so just like uh, west uh, in the in the sea, like next to Spain, kind of shows a perspective. And they lived there until they went extinct about 4,000 years ago, so... They went extinct relatively recently that we have DNA from these guys. And we know quite a bit about these guys, and they're really weird. So that's why I'm excited to talk about them. So their fossil record extends over 5 million years. So from the Pliocene to, uh, into, to, as I mentioned, the Holocene. And we'll explain what happened to them. So what happened was the first remains found kind of by Dorothea Bate in 1909. And they've been found in Ice Age deposits. And there have been other fragmentary remains, things like that. And then they were described. So typically the history of these guys is about six different species of Myotragus. And they're considered chrono species. So chrono species are species in time that are believed to lead into each other. So there's believed to be six species. Uh, the first one being in Palmaboni. And this is the representation of the final species and the smaller species of M. Baloructus, which is the one that was described originally, from the Pliocene to Holocene of Marcelona and Bicona, if you say that. So in terms of its evolutionary relationships, as I mentioned, it, is, it looks like a goat, but it's actually closest living relative, looking at genetics, is actually the Tarkin. And they're estimated to have a genetic divergence of about 7 million years ago. So that was back in the Miocene, they would have split apart from each other. So this is basically like a weird little European Tarkin, and, and even though it looks much more like a goat, which is really, really interesting, and it shows how much genetics can tell us. So they're a little Tarkin. So the ancestors of these guys would have... Uh, kind of got into the uh, Balearic Islands around the late Miocene, which was when the Strait of, G Strait of Gibraltar closed, and that led to the sea levels of the Mediterranean dropping down da drastically. So the ancestors of Myotragus, or the mouse, mouse goats, would have been able to walk across to these islands and have no issues. But then later, after the Strait opened again and the Mediterranean refilled about 5 million years ago, the populations of the early ancestors would have been stuck on this island. And then the changes, there were lots of changes to morphology as that led to up to their extinction. So they went for five million years. They always, they changed so much to adapt to island living. So this happens to a lot of animals. It's called insular dwarfism. It is the reverse is insular gigantism and dwarfism. You could say gigantism happens to a lot of smaller animals that become big because of the more resources and available niches and islands. But in the case of Myotragus, uh, I would say the gigantism part applies to the giant otter. Or the Sardinian giant otter, but dwarfism applies to these guys. So as these larger uh, mouse or these larger kind of goats and like things got stuck on the island because of the limited resources and the lack of predators, 
uh, they would have gotten smaller to better adapt to those conditions because the limited resources and lacking competition. So that means they could basically uh, get smaller to allow more animals to live because there's less carrying capacity on an island. And also there's not many big predators, so they would have been able to slow down kind of a little bit and not need to be a bit bigger as they were. So being having all those limited resources and all that can be quite a strong, uh, strong selective pressure. So that's what led them to get smaller. And as you can see through the Corona species, they got smaller and smaller and smaller until they got to this last species, as I mentioned, that's represented here as the smallest of them all. And we'll get into that. So they actually, uh, as well, they originally only colonized the island of Makolona. And there's only a handful of species of mammals on that island. They include shrews, hapsons, rabbits, and mice, and things like that. Uh, but the light Pliocene, my track was actually one of the three genera uh, of mammal pleasant on Maslona, alongside kind of the giant dormouse and giant, sh uh, giant sh uh, shrews. And they were present until the Holocene. And then on Merikano, there's the giant rabbit, if you've heard of Nucularis rex, uh, which was a really big rabbit. As you can see, they're... They got big as well. So that was a big giant rabbit. They believe they got up to like 5 or 10 kilograms or something like that. A huge rabbit, 10, 15 kilograms. Uh, you can see even on similar islands next to each other, because these guys only lived in the one island, so another species got big to occupy that big herbivore niche in the ecosystem. But then what happened was, uh, uh, during a fall in the uh, Pleistocene, so what happened was when these two islands connected during the Pleistocene with the sea level drop, uh, the Nugoris rex kind of went extinct because of the Myotragus coming and replacing that niche. So that really shows how dynamic these can be. And they would have come in and replaced the uh, giant Lagomorph, which was really, really interesting. So it shows that even within the islands, things can change all the time. They can still be quite dynamic. And two different islands, very close to each other, kind of the same niche available. Two di very different animals took that niche. So I think that's really, really interesting. So in terms of its description, there's a great variety of sizes between the species of Myotragus. So the first kind of species, an early species, would have been about 60 kilograms or 130 pounds. Uh, later ones got into uh, about 23 kilograms and Cooperi about 23 kilograms or about 51 pounds, showing they were evolving to being smaller and smaller. With the last species, uh, Balaractus, which is this one here, got to about 50 centimeters tall, or a little over a foot tall at the shoulder, and uh, would have weighed about... Um, half the size of those so about like 10 15 maybe even like 20 kilograms would be the biggest uh, and one thing as well as you can see the large eyes they've got very interesting eyes that face forward unlike most goats that have them on their sides of their face these guys have very forward eyes that give them great binocular vision which is really interesting they also have those small horns there those very small direct horns and um, they have a single ever-growing tooth which is uh, which is an incisor, and it's very unusual for bovids is to have that kind of thing. They also have one premolar and three molars in lower jaw. And this just makes they have a very uh, interesting jaw that's not that typical. They have that ever-growing incisor that's very much almost like a, more like a rodent or a rabbit than a goat or a bovid of any kind. So a very interesting mouth. Oh, you guys probably injured or something. Anyway, we'll have a look at you. Yeah, really, really interesting in that regard. In terms of its diet, these guys, uh, the tooth morphology and uh, stuff of earlier species of Myotragus considered they'd be grousers or mixed feeders. Uh, the later species was likely predominantly a browser, so these guys are most likely browsers. They would have predominantly uh, fed on boxwood and things like that. It would have been a large part of their diet. And the Cretes hypsodonti over time, it means they would have been, these guys would have adapted to eating more abrasive food because being on an island, they'll need to take better advantage of those resources. Uh, so being able to eat more abrasive food would allow them to tap into a food source that was available to them because they've got to adapt to the island they're living on because there's nowhere of getting out. So you better get used to uh, what you're living with, pretty much. But also, uh, there's also some really interesting adaptations about their physiology. So the bone histology of uh, this last species shows there's uh, lamina zonal tissue through the uh, cortex which is a feature that's only other seen in like endothermic reptiles so that's very very interesting 
So the growth of the bones of these guys is very unlike any other mammal. And sibilates more to crocodilians in growth rates. And they have slow and adaptive growth rates. As they will uh, immediately cease growing altogether and reach their maximum size. Or their stomatic maturity and potentially sexual maturity about 12 years of age. So they grow more like a crocodile than they do a tarkin. Which is very, very interesting in that regard. And this pattern of growth indicates the same way uh, that extant reptiles can adapt their metabolism. Myotragus would have adapted their metabolism to kind of deal with the changing food and water and temperatures that would have been on the island. So they would have been uh, basically... Uh, trying to adapt to the island as best they could because it's only a small island and there's only so much you can kind of do uh, to survive so being able to delay that is another good survival strategy a lot of animals that live on islands will kind of slow down their breeding because there's a uh, small carrying capacity so if you easily it's very easy to have too many of an animal and then basically the whole population's messed up because the carrying capacity is too high so to keep the population at that right level they breed really slow to compensate because uh, they, they don't have any predators as well so they slow down their breeding just to make sure they keep their population because the population is mostly limited by the resources of the island they're living on so it's really really interesting uh, another thing as well is newborn specimens of uh, Myotragus basilactus would have actually been about 15 to 18 centimeters tall about 5 to 7 inches in height and weigh about 700 to 90 grams which is 1.5 to 2 pounds which is actually really weird which is actually 2% of a mature adult while most babies are typically of ruminants uh, typically over 4% so they're like nearly half the size of what a typical newborn ruminant would be which is also another really interesting thing about them. And um, also their high crown teeth uh, of these guys would have grew more slowly than other caprines as well. And their last teeth would have erupted at about six years of age to kind of uh, show like an adaption to that longevity as well. And based on skeletal chronology and dent, uh, dental durability analyses, uh, they actually would have been quite long lived with uh, some specimens having a lifespan of 27 years. Uh, which is quite long, nearly 30 years, a 30 year lifespan for an animal that small. R comparison, it's believed to be that T-Rex would have had about the same lifespan of about 30 years. So this guy, little guy has the same lifespan as a T-Rex, which is really, really interesting. And the estimated mortality rates would have been quite a bit lower than a lot of other bovids because uh, lots of babies would have grown up to be adults because there wasn't too many predators. So if uh, it shows that these guys would have ha wouldn't have had that high mortality rate, which is really interesting. Let's see, uh, is the uh, dad back? Should be. Oh, here he is. We'll have a look at you while we talk about you. I just love these guys. So, in terms of movements and senses as well, these guys have uh, uh, bones that were of the foot were tightly bound by ligaments and things, so they would have been quite a slow walker and didn't have quite a good abil ability to jump, but this would have allowed them to save energy. So they would have had a shock, a shock absorbing mechanism in their foot bones as well to pretty much take that shot and allow them to have that ability to uh, move uh, quick and the ability to move quick was kind of unnecessary on these predator free islands and these guys would have uh, been able to better adapt for bending stresses so they would have been a little bit better climbers in that regard so they would have gave up slow uh, kind of being able to run fast they would have been able to better move more energy efficiently and also be a little bit more flexible in that regard and reduce the bending stresses so it's a little bit of an adaption a little bit better for climbing in that regard and save a bit of energy compared to other caprines today as well and the uh, cranial endocast of the species as well shows that the part of the brains and structures associated with sounds uh, smells and vision is actually strongly reduced and the brain was actually only half the size uh, of other comparably sized caprines and this is likely to represent optimizations of the animal's energy budget. So this would have basically uh, reduced the size of their brains so they could save uh, energy having such a big brain. Because energy, as I mentioned, because there's so much limited resources, is a big limiter on these guys. So they basically got rid of that. And they wouldn't have really needed to detect predators uh, because they they just really needed to move around and eat and fly food. They didn't need to worry about predators, so that allowed them to kind of adapt to be a little bit more energy saving. And the binocular vision as well of these guys, because they have the forward facing eyes, as I mentioned, would have allowed for depth perception. So this would have gave them um, basically better to judge distances and things to be able to jump and kind of move through areas. So better depth perception allowed them to move through their habitat more effectively. And the outward facing eyes typically given to ungulates, you know, the wide eyes that they have is to spot predators. So the forward facing eyes, because they don't need to see predators anymore, they can focus and put their 
binocular vision specialize in that so they can better see uh distances and judge distances a lot better than a lot of other ruminants which is really interesting so in terms of their extinction so diverse dates have been given to the three national uh native terrestrial mammals of uh Malkosia and Medosia. so these guys and the giant dormouse and the giant shrew they would have disappeared in a very short period of time about the third millennium bc that there is debate what it was could have been climate change or whether it could have been human settlers though the dominant theory does suggest to be uh human causes with traditional methods dated the first human colonization between 5000 bc and even before but uh, subsequent tests of modern method of dating clearly indicate there was no human presence before 13,000 uh, 3000 bc and um, the dates are very closely with the fast decline of these forms so basically it's most likely these guys were wiped out by early humans about four and a half thousand years ago and it's been quite uh, and it's very likely that they went extinct less than a hundred years after people got to that island so a little bit sad and there's also been pe people suggesting they may have been slightly domesticated but uh there's been to be uh marks on these uh guys horns and things like that but it's been quickly shut down because they actually may be in resulting of uh, gnawing on bones uh, of other microtragus or mouse goats to kind of uh, get nutrients and calcium from that. But yeah, really, really awesome little animal. So definitely a big, big fan. Really, really cute little goober. So yeah, that's uh, another one done by Narwhala. And last one by Narwhala. Last, but so certainly not least, we've got the Sicilian Dwarf Elephant. We have got uh, Paleoloxodon falconi, uh, falconry, if you say that really really awesome little guy here and though i can't go little because it's a dwarf elephant so these guys are a species of dwarf elephant from the middle pleistocene so they uh come from sicily and malta and actually among these there's lots of dwarf elephants throughout their evolutionary history because lots of elephants are great swimmers so they're able to get to islands pretty effectively uh and a lot of them kind of get to these islands then as the sea level goes uh goes up they get stuck there and then they have to survive they have to shrink and but these guys are actually one of the smallest if not the smallest of any of those adaptive radiation of elephants that uh got out to any of these islands and became dwarfs so they were very very small so they only got one meter tall about three foot three and as a member of the genus paleoxodon they are believed to come from a uh, paleoxodon antiquus which is actually one of the largest uh um elef uh, elephants so they would have been about 20 24 tons uh also known as a straight tusked elephant and one thing as well is believed to be the largest uh the mendes which is the uh kind of asian straight tusked elephant these guys could have up to like potentially up to 30 tons would have actually been the same genus as these little guys so that's so wild in my opinion but yeah let's talk about the chronology we'll talk about how they evolved so these guys are believed to come from the four meter tall straight tusked European straight tusked elephant uh, P. Antiquus that it arrived in Europe about 800,000 years ago. The oldest specimens of Paleoloxodon in Sicily came from about half a million years ago or 500,000 years ago. Uh, P. Falconry's ancestors kind of most likely came from Sicily from the Italian mainland, up through the peninsula. The chronology of the species compare it to the larger species of Paleoloxodon that lived there, the two meter tall Paleoloxodon. Uh, Miranandi is, but it's somewhat uncertain. Though it's generally believed to be the earlier species. So these guys would have come from the Middle Pleistocene, they're about half a million years before. And P. Uh, Mirandandius actually comes from a later radiation of mammoths, uh, um, elephants coming through. So you can see Falconry is the smaller one, hence the older one, and the bigger one is a kind of a later radiation of elephants coming in. So that's really, really interesting. Uh, so uh, the P. Mirandus would have been P. Antiquus coming into the islands about two, 200,000 years ago. So uh, Falconry would have been on uh, these islands like 300,000 years before uh, Mirandandius would have come on these islands. And Falconry also uh, per, uh, occurs in Malta, but it's generally shorter, which is believed to be like a subspecies, but we don't really use that. And it likely uh, dispersed from Malta from Sicily during uh, low episodes of low kind of sea level. So being able to just walk through there. And the chronology of the Maltese locations are poorly constrained. And there's quite a big sample suggests that there would have been a date about 366 to 233,000 years ago uh, with its large sample of falcon rye kind of living through there. So let's have a look at the female over here. We'll have a look at the female. So in terms of like taxonomy, they're thought to be Elephus falcon rye because they, everything was an Elephus, but now Paleoloxodon. So these guys are kind of one of the most famous samples of uh, insular dwarfism. 
So adult individuals of these species would have got the same size as modern elephant calves. So there's been studies looking into their size. The most recent estimates kind of put them about here. So the 2009 study, kind of this is uh, the most recent one, kind of puts the estimates. So we'll go through. So the adult male would have been about 250 kilograms, so about a quarter ton. 250 kilograms for this male uh, Sicilian dwarf elephant. Uh, about 150 for about a female. So that's 551 pounds to uh, 332 pounds for uh, a male and female respectively. And this little newborns, we'll have a look at these little babies here. Look at this little cutie. How can you not be a fan of this little cutie baby elephant? So the newborns would have been about 7.8 kilograms. And there's even older estimates that would put them a little bit smaller. So they would have been about 33 centimeters tall at uh, born. So about a foot tall at when they were born. And between 6 to uh, six to 8 kilograms. So that's really, really cute. Definitely a big fan. The older estimates would suggest that uh, a male kind of elephant could have got to about uh, 305 kilograms about 300 kilograms and the female got a little, little bit heavier about 168 so yeah that's still in the line of possibility so around 300 kilograms would have been for a big male be yeah, so awesome really do love these guys so um the morphology of these guys these are what you call pedomorphic so pedomorphic traits kind of uh features that you typically see on young animals and usually when animals kind of become smaller uh through populations like elephants they usually become look a lot more like baby elephants uh, humans are a great example because our heads look very much like uh chimps a baby chimps head as the adult chimp kind of has a really big jaw and things like that but if you compare uh, adult human skull to a chimp baby chimp skull they look quite similar so humans are quite neotonic or quite pedomorphic so uh, these elephants have a lot of pedomorphic traits that are very similar to those if you look at a baby like indian elephant or a baby african elephant and you look at a p falcon right adult you'll see a lot of very similar characteristics and even if you look at paleoxodon uh, baby paleoxodons you'd probably see the same things so they have a brain that's about the size of humans but it's much larger in proportion to the skull compared to antiquus so these guys have quite a big brain for the body ratio much bigger than other elephants and compared to p adult p antiquus these guys have also got longer necks uh, wider torsos and longer forelimbs and their forelimbs were short the uh, hind limbs were longer and their forelimbs were shorter so you can see they've almost got like that corgi look to it um, the limbs were also more slender than uh, antiquus because they need to support much less weight and they uh, feet were more digigrade and narrower and higher than modern elephants and this morphology actually suggests that these guys were much more nimble than uh, modern elephants because they may have most likely lived in quite uneven terrain and we'll have a look at the females and talk about them for a little bit. So the females of these elephants would have been uh, uh, tuskless, as you can kind of see here, very similar to like modern Indian elephants. The females would have been tuskless, and due to the much smaller size, would have been uh, increased heat loss. So it's very possible that P. falcon rye may have had a coat of uh, hair, very similar to an, a mammoth, because being smaller, it's a lot harder to retain heat. Though we don't really know too much about that. So it's very possible they would have needed that, and um, they would have needed that hair. Ears would have likely also been much smaller than other uh, modern elephants because they didn't need to get rid of so much heat uh, as well. And bone histology actually looking at these guys determined that the small size, they would have still grown very slowly. So P. Antiquus would have reached maturity at about 15 years of age, which is actually older than living elephants. And some individuals would have lived for about 60, 70 years, which is as comparable to full-size elephants. And as I mentioned, that's kind of another thing that happens with island populations because they're limited by the resources. The, uh, they tend to live longer. They tend to mature later and live longer. Same thing happened to the Myotragus, and it happens to all sorts of uh, animals that kind of shrink island dwarfism all across the world. Animals typically, when they're limited resources, they have less babies so they can better sustain their populations because uh, they don't need to breed so much, which is really interesting. And in terms of its ecology and what it ate, uh, dental microware suggests that these guys were mixed feeders, so they were both feeding on grasses and uh, browse, so quite general in that regard. And very interesting, these guys would have lived in a very interesting island in ecology. There were actually swans that were taller than it. There's a species of swan that lived in Sicily and Malta that would have been uh, taller than these guys, so standing way taller, which is so interesting. You think of that bizarro world where there's swans taller than elephants and things like that. But these guys uh, would have had quite an interesting fauna. So there were cat-sized giant dormouse, 
as well as other types of jaw mouse and there was also giant otter uh neolutra also giant shrews there's also believed to be a fox that lived on the island but that's unconfirmed sicily also had all sorts of bird species such as uh, as well as frogs uh, lizards snakes pond turtles tortoises and bats so a lot of the same ecologies that we have today plus some really weird ones like these guys and the giant swans talking about that and all that really really cool so very very awesome animal another great one by narwhala love this guy how can you not be a fan of this guy so awesome so as i mentioned the elephant bird the bush antler deer, the Sardinian giant otter, the uh, Myotragus or cave goats, the Ballarat cave goats, and the Sicilian dwarf elephants or P. falconry, all done by Narwhaler. Uh, really did a knocked it out of the park with all these interesting extinct species. But we're going to be going on a bit of a sad note, I think, soon. We'll be talking about a species that could very well become extinct in our lifetimes or even within the next 10 years if we mess it up. So look at these really wonderful animals. Definitely a big fan. So next up, we have got by Leaf and Jen, we have got the Vanita. So um, really, really awesome animal here. Oh, Vanquita, if you say that. Let's see if any of them will actually be swimming. We're back. So the Vanita or Podsena sinus. These guys, oh, I think we'll actually just slow it down a bit. So Panita sinus, these cute little guys here. So these guys are a species of porpoise endemic to the northeastern end or, or the northern end of the Gulf of California in Mexico, in Baja California. And they're the smallest of living cetaceans. So they get a maximum body length of about 150 centimeters or 4 foot 9 uh, in females and about 140 or 4 foot 6 in males. Well, females are slightly bigger. But yeah, taxonomy, these guys are the genus uh, Posenita, which includes uh, other species of shallow species living uh, porpoises. They include the spectacle porpoises, but they're most likely related to the Bermuda's porpoises. And these two species may have split around the Ice Age during the Pleistocene, which is interesting. And the name in Spanish means a little cow, and they're definitely a cute little name for a cute little guy. So um, they were described in 1958 based on morphology, uh, which is also quite interesting. And as I mentioned in their description, they're the smallest living uh, species of cetacean. And they can be quite interesting to distinguish from other species of the rain because of their size. They have a small body, a triangular dorsal fin. The coloration you can see is mostly grey with a darker band with its around its eye and things like that. There's also prominent black uh, uh, features that surround their eyes and their lips. Uh, sexual dimorphism apparent in both uh, in this body size with males, uh, mature females being much longer than the males and the ma males having larger heads and wider flippers. So as I mentioned, females get a maximum length of about 150 centimeters, males about 140. Uh, they also be known to weigh about 27 kilograms, about 60 pounds to 68 kilograms, 150 pounds. Uh, so quite a range, wide range there, so quite big. And makes them one of the smallest species of porpoise, if not the smallest species. So really, really cute little guy. So these guys also have a very, very small range. So these guys are restricted to a small portion of the upper Gulf, uh, Gulf of California, called the Sea of Cortez. And is the smallest range of any marine mammal. They live in shallow, turbid waters less than 150 meters deep and inhabit murky, warm waters within 26 kilometers of the shoreline since there's a high amount of availability of that as well and a strong tidal mix as well, high availability of food. And since they're able to vibe in shallow water, they are triangular-shaped uh, triangular dorsal fin actually sticks out above the water and it's actually common mistaken for dolphins. And they are generalists in terms of their diet. These guys will feed on all sorts of fish, crustaceans, squid, and uh, things like that. Though they'll also eat bethnic fish, such as croakers and grunts as well, that make up most of their diet. So look at all these cute little guys here. In terms of social behavior, they're typically seen alone or in pairs, often with a calf, but have been known to live in groups of up to 10 individuals. So uh, little is known about their history or their life history. Uh, life expectancy is estimated to be about 20 years, and their age of sexual maturity is about 3 to 6 years of age. While initial analysis of stranded and Vanita estimated two-year calving individual, they suggest that they may be able to read a calf a year, so annually. They're also thought to be uh, polygamous, uh, mating uh, with uh, baits to, with males to compete for females, and there's competition evidence by the pressure of sexual dimorphism, with females being larger than males, small group sizes, and large testes, with the male having a testes about 3% of their body mass, which is really interesting. Really, really cute little Vanitas here. The little cow. I love the name of Quidita little cow's names. That's so cute. 
but we're going to be talking about their population. So, because the Ven uh, Venita was only described in late 1980s, historical abundance is not really known, but there are records. The first comprehensive study looking at these guys took place in 1997, where the population was estimated to be about 567 individuals. But by 2007, that dropped to 150. Uh, and then populations in 2018 seem to be under 19. And because of that, it's now been estimated in 2023, there's only about 10 to 13 living individuals of Anita. But luckily that is considered to be stabilized. As, but we'll get into that. So it's really, really sad. But in terms of reproduction, as I mentioned, they reach sexual maturity about three to six, uh, uh, three to six years old. And they'll have pregnancies that last 10 to 11 months. And the Venita calves will be nursed by the mother by 6 to 8 months until independent. They typically give birth every other year to a calf, or sometimes yearly, usually between, uh, between month of February to April. Because of their la long reproductive rate, their long gestational period, and larger species size, Venitas are considered a K-selective species. And K-selective species tend to be more uh, vulnerable to extinction because they spend much more time on having less babies, but making sure they're all happy and healthy rather than just producing as many babies as possible so they invest a lot in the babies so if you kill too many of them it's very easy for their populations to crash so uh that's another thing as well but we'll talk about the threats and why they are such an endangered species uh which is really sad because i actually put in this enclosure this is the about 13 i believe there's 13 in here yep this is about uh, believed to be the amount of living vanitas uh the high popular uh, portion of the estimate so there's this is about 13 vanitas in this enclosure which is about the same as the highest estimate of the world population which is a very sad thing it's not very often to do that uh, so that shows how little there actually are in more of a visual way but the threats to these guys include things like uh commercial fishing like bycatch that's the main reason things like shrimp catching uh also the now endangered uh topago which is a type of fish shrimp and things like that so they get caught in gill nets and because the, they use echolocation and don't have good vision uh, these nets are too thin to be caught by their echolocation, so they basically sound just goes through them, and then they get caught in that tangle up and die, which is very, very sad and a very, very horrible death as well. And that has been caused of their decline as well, because that's illegal fishing as well. So there's been illegal fishing presence in their habitat, and that has been a big issue in their decline. They do face other threats, but their biggest threat is that gill nets but other threats they do face include habitat alteration like pesticide runoff there's been lots of evidence that there's been pesticides kind of coming into their habitat and uh, affecting them collecting in their bodies as well and also decreasing their populations as well um, also pollution as i mentioned in that regard habitat alteration there's been lots of like fishing and trawling and another thing as well is because their population is so low now uh, inbreeding depression is a very big thing because a lot of the animals will be very closely related to each other which then would mean that they would uh, be breeding with relatives and means they've got less of a genetic pool to kind of be able to adapt from and that can lead to issues with uh, fertility and su sustainability like with diseases quite susceptible to diseases which is really really sad and um, these declines, as I mentioned as well, there's been actually attempts to try and breed them in captivity, but that's not been very successful. As um, there could be a last attempt to save the species, but the, the success, of the, the efforts in 2007 actually killed the one female, which was uh, really not good. But um, yeah, well, have a look at the baby one, because the baby one's so cute. Look at this little man over here. Let's see if we can put you in the water. No, we can't put you in the water. Are you going to come in the water? I don't think so. This is all the adult Vanitas. Uh, we'll have a look at the adults because the adults are so cute. But so sad of their story. But in terms of their conservation status, because of their decline, they are considered critically endangered. With only, at the moment, between 10 to 13 living individuals. But luckily that is considered to be stabilized. So there's been lots of efforts. Uh, since they found in such a small area, it can be easy to kind of find them and stuff like that. Uh, there's a lot of efforts to try and, um, especially the swim batters of the animal, the totobika, which is a fish that lives in their habitat and is food for these guys, are sold in the black market by cartels for profit. Uh, also, um, illegal fishing is a big issue for these guys, as I mentioned, and just uh, the catching for shrimp and things. The Mexican government has been tried to recommend and implement plans to reduce bycatch, things like that, and a lot of efforts has been going to, uh, to kind of save the population. Things such as kind of getting rid of poachers and trying to get rid of the people selling the bladders and things like that. It's referred to the cocaine of the sea because of that black market for the Tobago kind of swim bladders as well. 
and lots of international organizations like Sea Shepherd uh, and things like the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society at Busa de Berlina and Pace Finita has been another program to try and ban gill nets in the area. And a lot of that has typically been uh, kind of considered unsuccessful because of uh, socioeconomic factors like like well, how else are these uh, f fishermen are going to make money uh, things like that a lot of really interesting uh, it's a very interesting like story because of how much things like the socioeconomic position it's very political uh, trying to stop the decline of Anita it's interesting in that regard because that is tied so much to the economy of these people and because that the conservation of these guys would actually very much impact the ability to make money for a lot of these people uh, and a lot of these fishermen around the area but there's been efforts as i mentioned captive breeding is not considered viable but luckily there has been efforts throughout mexico to try and protect them and uh things like that like establish holiday holiday uh no not holiday habitat corridors and things like that and create buffer zones to try and protect them uh, mainly it's just been kind of surveying at the moment trying to really find a way to protect them but they are considered to be uh stabilized right now so they are kind of not losing anymore and most recent surveys have been seeing them with calves so it seems that they could make a comeback as long as we just keep that going and there's actually been research into their like uh populations and see how they would cover so if we just got rid of the gillnet issue barring forgetting all the other issues such as um pollution things like that if you just banned gill nets in their range they would be able to bounce back perfectly fine so they do quite well but because of the shrimp and the tobago kind of animals that's might not happen until uh, recently but we will they have stabilized at the moment so it's very possible they could come back from this and um they because 80 percent of the shrimp caught uh, from this is in highly uh, uh aquatic mammal like bycatch rate so they get lots of caught in the shrimp uh, which is another big issue as well the shrimp and the tobago because lots of people eat shrimp and the case the u.s uh, kind of consumption of shrimp is actually contributed to the uh, extinction of the Vanita or extinction crisis and the marine mammal act uh, suggested for birds foreign fishes from exporting seafood and actually because the u.s might actually pull out of that because that's destroying the marine mammal uh, protection act so they may actually pull out of that which means there'd be less money for the people there that means they might have to push some legislation or protect them there'll be less fishermen so yeah it's a very complicated issue because it deals with people's livelihoods and lots of politics but hopefully that can be all sorted out to save the species because really even though it's stabilized it could be like the next couple of years oh we've down to three vanitas and uh oh they're extinct and they'll be truly one of the saddest extinctions because they're so cute they're so important and they're really uh, an animal that shows they're a canary in the coal mine. So if you can't take care of a charismatic animal like this, what's going to happen to the rest of the world? So they're very much that canary in the coal mine. But yeah, really, really awesome little animal. So Leaf and Jen really did a great job with the Vanita. And it's a little bit of a call for message, you know, protect the world. You know, I like to put that conservation message. And it definitely puts just having 13 of these animals in this enclosure puts them into perspective to show this is the wild population but animals have come back from that so uh even though inbreeding depression a thing there actually is genetic evidence to suggest that uh the population of anita has gone through bottlenecks in the past so that's very likely that they can recover from this one so as long as we just allow them we get rid of the gill nets try and put up protected barriers make sure these guys do okay they can recover and do pretty well potentially afterwards we know they've done that before we know from their genetic history that they've done it in the past and they could most likely do it again as long as we get rid of the things like gill nets uh put some protections in place make sure they're good enough food all that we could potentially save the species so yeah really really awesome animal to show off so um yeah great episode leaf and jen did a great job of it eater and it's a great way to talk about conservation i love talking about conservation and um these guys are definitely worthy of it and it's a very cute story uh interesting story for these cute little guys but yeah definitely uh, awesome so uh yeah thank you for nawala and leaf and jen because you basically did all the mods today nawala especially with all the island animal mods i love talking about that kind of more evolutionary trends and conservation things like that so i really enjoyed this episode so um yeah i uh really 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 hope you guys have enjoyed this video i hope you guys like and subscribe always remember to hit the little bell icon to get notified below anything so yeah hopefully you guys enjoyed this video hope you guys like and subscribe and bye bye